So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so today we are going to have a seventh lecture in this Okay, so today we are going to have seventh lecture in uh, our series of introduction to science education organized by Department of Science Education and uh, very well welcome to all of you and we are really honored to have uh, Professor Ramanujan as our today's speaker and um, given the impact and the vastness of his work in the field of education, whatever I am going to say about him is uh, not going to be enough but uh, still I will try to uh, briefly say something about him. So, uh, so he is a retired faculty from IMSC. Uh, he was in the computer science department and his area of research was mathematical logic and theory of computations. Currently he is a visiting faculty at Azim Prem G University um, in Bangalore. So he has done extensive uh, field work in the field of education, especially in the math education. Um, he is associated with Tamil Nadu Science Forum and uh, he is the editor of uh, a magazine called Thulir. Okay? So this is a monthly magazine for children. Um, he is also a member of steering committee of National Science Curriculum Framework uh, of 2005 and has chaired national focus group on teaching of mathematics by NC, uh, NCERT. He is a president of Mathematics Teachers Association of India and is on the education committee of ACM India and um, the association of symbolic logic. He was also a member of the committee set up by Tamil Nadu government in 2022 to formulate a state's education policy. He was also awarded in 2020 Indira Gandhi Award for Science Popularization uh, the, uh, by the Indian National Science Academy. But on the top of this all, what I like uh, the most of him is that he is a passionate teacher and uh, he is an extremely good speaker. So we are really glad to have you, Professor Ramanujan. So over to you. He is going to speak about uh, doing science in the science classroom. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much, uh, Supriya, for that uh, introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to come to Aisar Pune and uh, talk to you all. I was in the audience a couple of months ago when I came here for, in this room, there was this computational thinking in schools meeting for a couple of days and uh, so, pleasure to be here again and uh, so, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, so what I want to talk about, um, I don't know if it's uh, really introduction to science education, but it's uh, sharing of some experiences that uh, I've had in my long association with Tamil Nadu Science Forum, which is a, what I call a voluntary disorganization. It's certainly voluntary and certainly it's disorganized, but uh, with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, so through that, I've been quite fortunate to interact with a large number of mathematics teachers and science teachers and children, school children. Um, and it's been a great learning experience and I want to talk about some questions, some issues that have come through this experience. So feel free to interrupt any time and ask, you know, make comments, raise questions and so on. There is no syllabus to cover, so I just have some things to talk about. And if I f t talk for too long, shut me up, Supriya. And I tend to talk, so please shut me up. Okay, so here is a science classroom, class 9. You know, familiar thing. Subject is Newton's laws. And 
Recently, you go in and ask children, you know, what is Newton's first law? You know, you get a chorus. Everybody which is at rest or in a state of uniform motion continues to be in the same state until an external force is applied. And then I say that, yeah, but what is at rest, right? Consider a sleeping dog. I mean, after all, it's at rest, right? I mean, this is what we call rest. And suddenly it gets up and runs. So where is the external force? And children all, you know, there's a lot of uh, love. Some children say something. And some children say, you know, no, no, it's because of some noise that the dog woke up. I say, let's put a nice glass dome over the dog. You know, let's make it soundproof so that no sound reaches. Still, the dog will get up, no? He say, no, no, there are vibrations on the ground. <laughs> okay, let's do something more so that, you know, this is harder, huh? <laughs> to get a dog not to feel vibrations. You know? And then some children say, no, there is internal force. I said, but Newton's law, nobody is saying, you know, they are saying external force, but you are now saying internal force. Maybe there is an internal force, an external force balance, and that is what is at rest. Uh, right. So something is going on. And the teacher is getting very frustrated because, you know, you are the scientist and I have called you and you are confusing the children, right? <laughs> but, you know, come on, we need something. And there is something about biorhythm, right? All kinds of interesting things come up. And usually you can have this discussion. It's worth like half an hour of confusion in the classroom, right? I mean, there is a lot of stuff coming around. And at some point, and I've done this many times, invariably, some child gets up and says, oh, come on, Newton's law, this is, dog is a living thing, right? This is biology, right? Not physics. <laughs> so, Newton's laws <laughs> don't apply for living things, really, right? It's only for non-living things. So, I go to the board and right? you know, Newton's laws apply only. And everybody, you know, who all say agree, all hands go up. So, democratically, we can decide that Newton's laws apply only. Teacher is furious by this time. You know, call you here and this. I said, but you have to do something, right? You have to answer this. And uh, so, so there is all this going on. As I said, internal and external forces. So, this is the proposal. And I say, okay, everybody is happy except, you know. And the teacher says, you know, but what do we do, right? The book is diplomatically silent on this issue, right? I've never seen a book which is introducing Newton's laws, discussing whether it applies to non-living th things only or living things or not, right? So now there is a bit of a unsure uh, this thing. And uh, so this is a very typical scene in a classroom, right? We are talking about something that, you know, for sure, you know, September, number of schools in the country discussing Newton's laws, right, class 9, we are talking, you know, a few million children are going through this. What is it that they are discussing? What is it that they are learning certain, you know, um, text, right? And uh, so this was a study conducted, um, well, two, day, two decades ago, I've said actually it's more, um, somewhere in the mid-90s that I was involved in. At the time, I was trying to learn something of science education and math education. And I thought that, uh, you know, and I was also working with several schools by then, Tamnath Science Forum we were doing. And so I went to actually eight schools at that time. And observing three themes, you know, looking at classes. And uh, so the themes that I chose were, one is Newton's Laws. Another was Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. This was inspired by a book by Krishna Kumar. I was reading. And uh, third <laughs> was Surge and Radicals. Okay. Now, this is the greatest tragedy of the lot. So, let me be silent on that. But, you know, think about Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, right? 1947, August 15, the country becomes independent. January 30, Mahatma is assassinated. And the book says he was the, um, he was the symbol of love, right? How is a child to understand Symbol of love being assassinated, you know, and, uh, okay. So, I, you know, this is a poignant moment in the history of the nation. So, what is happening in the history class at that time, right? And certs and radicals, because everybody considers it difficult, you know, talk to mathematicians, talk to 
teachers, students. There is a complete consensus it's a terrible thing. But it's part of the compulsory curriculum. I wanted to see what is happening in class. And as I said, that is the one that I'm going to be silent about because it's the most tragic of the lot. So the schools that I was visiting ranged from Chennai Corporation schools to, you know, those who know Chennai would know, like Padma Seshadri, PS High School and all, really competitive schools that take pride in, you know, so many JE rank, etc. to alternate schools that I'm abacus. One of the schools that I went to was the Krishnamurti Foundation School. So these alternative schools. And there is a difference, right? I mean, there is a difference you could see. But my idea was to look at what the curriculum said, what the syllabus document said, what was there in the textbook, what is happening in the class and after that I also had a, I looked at the, you know, both half yearly exam and the final exam, the questions that were asked on those syllabus units and then I went to the teachers and I was looking at the answer sheets, what children wrote in the thing and then a separate math club mode or science club mode with the children and with the teachers. So, so to get a, you know, as I said, Newton's laws was quite an eye-opener in this, right? Because at least there was some talk in the class, right? And in the better schools, there was demonstration, right? There was some illustration of from everyday life, you know, somebody actually, you know, in a school actually brought a bicycle and showed something, inertia, something was being shown. Mahatma Gandhi's assassination was quite a surprise to me because there was one thing that was not there in the class was no emotion, right? It might as well have been a class on you know, some other aspect of history. I mean, it is a regular history class and the fact that you were talking about, as I said, a poignant moment of the country, nothing. It was like a routine class. You know, some, uh, but when it came, to the real thing that struck me was the exam questions and answers. The kind of complete trivia that get asked, right? You know, there are schools which, um, you know, it's all reduced to facts, right? You know, God say kill Gandhi, right? Nobody has why. <laughs> Right? And nobody asked, you know, and it was even much worse. One of the schools had um, a light has gone out of our lives, dot, dot, dot. Who said this when? And you are supposed to say Jawaharlal Nehru said this, you know, broadcast when Gandhi died. And he did, you know, and a very eloquent speech. But is that what Mahatma Gandhi's, thing? I mean, it's completely reduced to 20 questions, you know, trivia thing, right? So one thing that, uh, you know, and all the, you know, politics behind it or whatever was not discussed anyway. Very few teachers had heard of any of this, you know. Later with the teachers, when we were having discussions, they had no clue about the background, nothing. At least Perry Mason style, yeah. I mean, you know, Godse killed Gandhi with a gun, no? Where did he buy the gun? What kind of gun was it? Something you would expect from the children, right? Nobody was asking, <laughs> right? So, what is going on? And anyway, so I'm not going to go into all of that. Uh, but, I mean, sad tale altogether. So, for me, this was a great, tremendous learning in, uh, you know, processes of uh, math and science education. As I said, I don't even want to mention surgeon radicals. So, Newton's laws might as well have been Newton's commandments, right? Some bearded bloke on a mountain saying first law, second law, third law, and you all do. And uh, the laws were, as I said, there was demonstrations at least. Right? There was some discussion, some demonstration, but they were taught as unquestionable axioms. Right? I mean, this is not something that it's truth. Right? And uh, the better classes provided some illustrative examples. But as I said, no questioning of this at all. Question that nobody asked was, why are these called laws? So uh, I asked children, you know, what are laws? What do you think children say? They ask what is a law, right? Hmm? Some things that are always true. Any other? Government laws. Government laws. Children say, I mean, my experience is, yes, what is a law? If you violate it, you get punished. <laughs> right? So I say, I want to violate Newton's first law. What punishment will I get? Right? <laughs> so children all laugh. But, uh, sir, you can't violate. Well, you said, you know, if I violate it, I get punished. I want to violate Newton's laws. So what will be the punishment and all? So definitely there is, you know, all this idea of universality and all physicists make a, much of a fuss about has nothing, you know, this business that is true, uh, no. 
I've never heard this, right? I've in teachers workshops also I was, why are Newton's laws called laws? What are laws? Okay. If they are true of the world, how do we know them to be true, right? How do you know that Newton's law is true, right? I mean, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You get one fat kid and, you know, heavy kid and one light kid and say pull. Of course, there is no equal and opposite reaction. What is going on, right? Of course, I'm trivializing the thing, you know, force diagram. You don't draw force diagrams out there. You, you know, nothing is happening there. So, this is one. And another question, which I didn't ask. Actually, this is a, ah, this is something that we almost never, I mean, if it were, if it were false, what difference would it make? What would you expect to see, right? So, these are things that we don't talk about. And this is something that I actually, one kid came up with. And I thought it was a beautiful question. What did people think before Newton? Did they think that every action doesn't have an equal or an opposite reaction? Or that, so what did they believe in, right? I thought it was a beautiful question, right? But this is, my point is that this is not the sort of discussion that ever takes place, right? And, uh, and also how do I apply these state statements to my experiences, right? So this actually led to a series which we called in Science Forum, which we called Dialogues in Science. We had many discussions. Balaji Sampati eventually published a book called The Case of the Sleeping Dog, right? So in good Perimason style, it was, it was a fun thing. We actually had a, so because we realized that for teachers to have talk in the classroom is very difficult and we need exercises. So that's why, so we need some kind of model dialogues, some things. Those days we didn't have, even now we are very bad at making videos or something. Published at least as a book, right? Books in Tamil. Right? So another one was, you know, Sivi Raman's famous thing, you know, why is the sky blue? It's a great thing that you can have a lot of conversation, but the teacher needs to feel secure. This is not something that you can have a conversation with. So how do you do? So that is part of this exercise that I'm talking about. But kind of having discussions in the classroom, this itself was quite a serious effort. Now, the tragedy for me was not that, you know, such questions are philosophical. I don't really expect, right? I'm not saying that all these questions should come in all our classrooms. Point is there was very little discussion, right? And uh, there was no, ar and this is very important for me, there was no argument originating from children's minds, right, based on their concerns stated in their language. The thing that I am talking about is my language, right? Children's language, children's concerns and their articulation is very different. And, and when, that, when a discussion happens in that language, then science is alive, right? Otherwise, it is, as I said, commandments, right? And uh, this is what we thought. And of course, what dominates the uh, classroom is the language of the textbook. And for mathematics, this is tyranny of the textbook, right? In some sense, the language of the textbook, you know, dominates things so much that it's impossible to think in any other terms. And you take pride in you, that you think in those terms. What about those who don't, right? The so disconnect becomes complete in that. And um, the tyranny of the textbook in general doesn't permit either the teacher or the students to approach the matter at all as something that can be explored or to be explored, right? So that it's only a finished product that you take. And, and I would say a culture of silence is death for the science classroom. I mean, then otherwise, you know, what is the process of science that we are talking about, right? So last year, Tamil Nadu government was distributing something called Kabasura Kudinir in all these things, okay? It's one herbal concoction. And so I was talking in a city college, quite a, you know, very good college. And it is just a, you know, bunch of undergraduate students, a large gathering. And I was asking, does Kabasura Kudinir cure COVID? I mean, you come to my place, four of us had COVID and we had like, you know, something like 12 packets of Kabasura Kudinir because government gives it free, right? They come and distribute it for all COVID patients. So, does it cure COVID? And uh, I mean, I, this is not a question that I'm interested in. But the point for me was, you know, this is, this, you know, undergraduate uh, science and math students in this college, something like 120 students in the class, in the hall, and it is almost vertically divided into a yes and no. And like I said, a we meant yes or a we meant no, right? And discussion was always, and when I started asking, why do you think so, this thing, you know, traditional medicines are important, right? 
Western medicines are probably important. What has it got to do with the question, right? And uh, what happened to evidence-based reasoning? It was very clear that the students were not talking about where is the data. Nobody was asking where is the data, where is the evidence. It's about this is important or that is important. Something is wrong, right? This has nothing to do with principles of science, right? I mean, how do you evaluate claims, right? How do you look at these things? What is the process? What questions should you be asking? So this is quite a serious uh, issue here. Okay, let me, I mean, I'm just, just to point out that that culture of silence, that lack of discussion is not about that class nine, you know, classroom and Newton's laws, right? It's something that pervades our way of thinking and, you know, when it comes to public life, how it manifests, that's why I was taking that example. But you can take many examples. We know all this, right? I mean, so, <clears throat> another experience, you know, TNSF organizes these, you know, so-called meet the scientist program, where, you know, you, I mean, I was from math science, getting my salary from DA, going to some village and, right? So, children meet scientists. So, I went and typically we would go in the evening, right? I would go from some program and uh, do one, take it. 16 inch telescope, do some program, night sky watching, right? And stay in the village and leave next morning for the next program. So I went to one village. And it was early evening and, uh, you know, there was a bunch of children. They were taking me around the village, showing me sights, right? And my guide was uh, this girl called Kuruama and, uh, you know, class seven. And we were going around and she was telling me a lot, talking about various trees, various plants, various herbs, birds, insects, and, uh, you know, she had plenty to talk about. Now, I'm a proper town bred guy, right? Through Science Forum, I've learned some these things. And that too, if at all I know some few, you know, tree names or bird names and all in Tamil, I can talk about a few. These kids know a lot, right? And I've worked extensively with the fishing community on, along the coast. How many fish can you name, right? I don't know in Maharashtra, right? Now, these children can, you know, talk about lots of fish, you know, all kinds of things. So, and I say, I don't know, and they're quite amazed, you know, these are scientists, right? So, I don't, scientists saying, I don't know all these things, and they know, they know, they think I'm just pretending, right? And the truth is, I don't know, right? And for instance, in the village, they were making, you know, good, right? And she knew a lot about all that, and uh, she could identify many constellations in the night sky, many of them have Tamil names, and it's there in the culture, right? And uh, so we had a lot of interaction and this Kuruma was somebody that I was, became very fond of. She was showing me so much and uh, insects. She knew so much about insects. Children are the one who watch insects, right? So they know a lot about insects. She was telling me, and what do I know, right? Okay. And then I spent the night and the next morning when I was leaving, the children came to say bye to me. And I said, oh, Kuruma, you're going to make a great scientist someday. And of course, all the children laughed. Yeah, I right, never get more than 20 in science, right? So, I mean, fund is clear, right? So, what are the chances that she's going to show up in ICER, right? I mean, that, yeah. yeah. So, what, what's the probability? I mean, Kuroma is a Dalit girl from an agricultural labor family, right? In, for those who know Tamil from the name, they can guess quite a lot. Our, you know, our culture is like that, right? You speak four words, everyone knows, fixes you exactly, you know, which region, which caste, which whatever, right? Everything is fixed for you, right? And uh, this girl, what, what are the chances that she'll become a scientist, right? I don't know. What probability will you put it? <laughs> Some probability, right? It's a real number between 0 and 1. <laughs> Where would you put it? <laughs> Okay, turn to the minor. See, I have been doing this polling. IISC, I had this colloquium where I was talking about Kuroma and this thing. So it's clear that everybody thinks that the probability is very low, right? So I'm saying everywhere in the scientific community, we all clearly see that all that stuff that I'm talking about is somehow not relevant, right? And uh, it's not, I don't mean in principle, I'm saying in practice, as a fact of life, right? Is it a problem of science education? Is it a problem of the institutions that we have got? Well, and uh, yeah. So, okay, I'll come back to Kuruvama later. So here is another discussion in some class nine, I think. What's the boiling point of water? 
chorus, right? 100 degrees Celsius. Everybody says 100 degrees Celsius. 100 degrees Celsius. Are you sure? Uh, some, ad some atmospheric pressure. Kuch, you know. Somebody wants to show off and add some caveats and all that. Um, you know, sea level, sir. <laughs> Achha, oh, sea level? <laughs> Are you sure? No. Chennai sea level, right? So, <laughs> so uh, sea level, okay. Some this thing. But what is all this? How do you know? Right? And, uh, you know, silence. Has anybody done an experiment? I think some child actually, I mean, always some child will put up a hand and say, yeah, I have done it. How did you do it? Oh, put a thermometer. Which thermometer? Oh, okay, thermometer is a problem, right? Yeah. So, lab thermometers, children haven't seen usually. A few have and, uh, you know, have worked with, but generally, you know, not. And many have actually, you know, worked with uh, these things. But now, as I said, thanks to, you know, Science Forum, now I have done this exercise many times, 50 times probably, right? We have gone, you know, done with groups of children, teachers' workshops, where you just, all we do is boil water and, you know, measure the boiling point. Thing is, you do it, you never get 100, right? You get 99.8, 100 point something, 98 point something. Of course, you never get 70, you don't get 120, but you never get 100. Much worse, in the same day, you know, with different groups, they are getting different uh, results. <clears throat> then you ask, you know, what is this? What does this mean? Right? Why is it that different people are getting different? Ah, parallax error. Ah, okay, parallax error. Right? Or maybe, you know, they are from different batches. Thermometer is bad. <laughs> okay. But then when you told me that, you didn't tell me thermometer could be bad. Right? And then came much more... So why do I never get 100, right? If it is water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, why am I not getting? And the thing is that you are doing all this, this thing, doing it 10 times and taking average, right? Still I am not getting. So somebody said that you do it many times, take average, you will get 100. Chalo, karle, karke dekhenge, of course you don't get. So, you know, there is some problem, right? And uh, which water are we talking about? Well water? tap water, metro water, <laughs> right? Bay of Bengal, <laughs> you know, if I collect water from Bay of Bengal, and, and that's also very interesting, right? I mean, you know, all that uh, salty water from the sea, you know, what is it, what is the thing boiling at? And, uh, and most importantly, if this is a problem, and then there is a lot of negotiation, right? That, and, ha uh ha, -huh, there is some, Sir, pure water will boil at 100 degrees. This purity is very important, right? Oh, I see, what is pure water? Right? Distilled water. Oh, okay. So, bisleri, you know, I don't know, this is bisleri, no? Okay. So, you can get one bisleri water and say, what is bisleri? Ah, bisleri water will boil at 100 degrees. You do it and it doesn't boil at 100 degrees. So, what is going on? And most importantly, if all this is happening, what business does the book have to put 100 degrees Celsius without anything else? Do we believe the book or not? Right? So, are they lying? No, no, they are talking about abstract water. This is something I actually heard from. <laughs> something I heard from a class 9 child and it warmed my heart. I said, oh, you know, come to math science. Really, you should come to math science. Right? I should introduce you to my colleagues and they'll be very happy. I mean, <laughs> So, she got the funda right. I mean, book mega hair though, it's some abstract object, right? <laughs> so, she was the only one who had the courage to articulate it and tell me, right? So, this is some abstract water. I said, wonderful, right? So, clearly, uh, you know, this is a complete disconnect, you know? So, if we talk about science education, right? Because to me, science lives in that negotiation. Right? When we have that argument about parallax error, we are talking about, you know, thermometers coming from different batches and we are talking about which water, right? That first chorus answer is not science. This is science. And then that led to fascinating projects. I mean, in that, uh, once this, we started doing that in Science Forum, we had amazing projects, you know. What is the boiling point of sambar, right? I mean, sambar has a boiling point, right? In Tamil Nadu, you know, how can you not know the boiling point of sambar, right? And then say, oh, our way of making sambar is different from what they do. Okay, yaar, Tinalveli sambar, what is the <laughs> boiling point? Trichy sambar, what's the boiling point? What's the difference? And then, actually, that led to a very nice project. I mean, uh, 
which has higher boiling point, cow's milk or buffalo's milk? I think it's a very important issue, you know. Well, these days, I, I don't know you guys, I was brought up on buffalo's milk. Trichy, like buffalo's milk was the common thing. And I really feel these days with all that cow stuff going on, right, buffaloes are not getting good <laughs> press, right. I feel very bad about it. But anyway, yeah, so cow's milk or buffalo's milk. And so here, the children who did this project, uh, they had a lot of fun. The, um, the, see, how do you measure boiling point of milk? You have to let it boil. That's not easy. The whole thing is going to over. And it's clear that if you wait too long, it is boiled over, right? If you take it too early, your reading is not correct. So what should you do? So there is this place called Melur near Madurai, where these kids actually did a, you know, three girls, and they did a very nice thing. They came up with a stick, you know, with a semaphore-like thing, you know, like a signal. And, uh, you know, you push it down, it goes up, and you pull it up, the thermometer goes down. So one person is waiting for the thing to boil, ha, 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 and so on, and the other one is uh, lifting it. And so this is a very nice thing. So this is instrumentation, right? This instrumentation, this is class nine girls came with it. And of course, that thing kept falling. They finally corrected it. They corrected the length. They corrected the thing. What more do you want? So science lives there, right? And then in boiling point of sambar, you know, we, that project was very nice, right? Because he said, okay, you put imli in sambar. Without imli, you can't have sambar. Right? Now, if I increase the Imli concentration, will the boiling point go up or go down? We have to predict. And, you know, this is acidic. Now, to, for children to even think of what that means, right? And what is the implication for that? You are really doing science, right? And then with the prediction and then you do that, take the data, they actually see that, you know, the boiling point changes. And then you can ask by how much, right? And then, of course, you don't... One group, we actually pushed all the way to plot a graph, write a, you know, write a quadratic equation to, you know, uh, describe the graph. I mean, they don't know curve fitting, but we could actually go that far, all from that boiling point of water. That is the point I was making, right? That discussion, that business of trying out, and this is experimentation, right? See, this is another pet peeve for me, that children, when they do, exp they don't do experiments. When they do experiments at all, what do they do? Book says this is the experiment and is one. In my undergraduate lab, this is something that I learned. In my school days, I never, I saw experiments, you know, our teacher would show something and we would all be seeing from a distance. He would show something and then take it away. Undergraduate lab, I went to Bichpilani, I learned that, uh, you know, before you go, engineering lab, three hour labs, electrical engineering, heavy stuff. Before you go to the lab, you look at what data you should be getting, right? And you spend three hours getting that data, right? <laughs> and uh, then after a little bit of maturity, I learned that the numbers are not important. It's the shape of the graph that's important, <laughs> right? So and this is good learning. And repeat, and I mean, I'm making a joke of it. Of course, repeating experiments is very important. You must learn to do that. That skill is important. But that has nothing to do with experimentation. Nothing to do with experimentation, which is the soul of science, right? Trying out such things, right? Like that boiling point of sambar and whether Imli changes it or not, right? A question that arises and you actually do something and those kids, you know, manipulating that semaphore, that is really the soul of science, right? And one of the great tragedies in school is that uh, beautiful thing called the record book. I don't know whether undergraduate records are that beautiful. High school record books are beautiful, really beautiful. And uh, in Tamil we say, muttu mutta, mani mani ya, you know, you have to write it like that. It has to look so lovely. Hmm? And uh, you go to scientists, you go to their labs, look at log books, it's got sambar on it, chicken curry on it, <laughs> ugly, <laughs> but it's genuine data, right? That is the difference, right? So by translating it into a ritual, right, into something that should look so beautiful and so beautifully produced, you have robbed it of the central thing that it was supposed to have, right. It has everything but the data, right. And uh, so that, so the attitude to experimentation that you get, right, that's what I wanted to mention. So here is another one that I was very fond of. Today, Bhas was talking about this time in science education. I was thinking of this uh, project that we were doing. I mean, start with the question like, how long does it take a, for a piece of cloth to dry, right? I mean, with all these rains happening, right? I mean, 
household is a very serious problem. You wash clothes and what the hell, yeah, I mean, right? It's an everyday problem. So you ask children, you know, what is very nice with class nine children is not like undergraduate classes. Class nine children, you go and ask, all children will give some answer. They have no problem at all about one hour, two hours, two and a half. What are you talking about? Which cloth, where, rainy day, this thing. And this actually led to a fascinating project. We had a beautiful project on this about, you know, varying various parameters, right? Different kinds of cloth, different kinds of places, you know, and the discussion on what does it take for cloth. It will evaporate. How does, you know, you know, what is drying, right? Water evaporated. You mean water boiled off? <laughs> I mean, which water is turning into vapor, you know, in cooking we see that, right? So what happened? Ah, huh, of course it didn't boil off. So how did it evaporate? <laughs> Suddenly this question comes. And then somebody says that, ah, wind is needed. Okay. But how does wind lead to evaporation? So, I mean, I don't want to go down that discussion, but I want to point out that and also actually measuring the time, right? to from starting with you know wet and uh, wrinkled thing to something that's completely dry under different conditions for different cloths and so on estimating and verifying was a fascinating uh, uh, thing again this how do you know business and doing it in fact how long does it take for an ice cube to melt we really you know children give ready to give yeah and then you ask how big is the thing oh okay so if we take like uh, 10 centimeter side ice cube, right? How long will it take to melt? Now it's a very precise question. But then under what conditions? So, you know, all sorts of questions in, in different places. How long does it take for something to biodegrade? So this is a fascinating thing, thing that we're doing with children. You know, bury things in different places in the school yard, right? And, you know, wood shavings, uh, paper, you know, uh, leaves, and uh, bhaji, you know, various things, plastic, of course, cut up and see, you know. And the thing is, plot, it, plot all these things over time, tabulate over time, right? So, this time thing we realized, exactly like dialogues, time thing we realized was very important because uh, one of my favorite things is to go to, you know, high school and ask, how long does it take for a science experiment? How long does a science experiment take? And what do children answer? 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Because if you are in class 8 or 9, the only experiments that you see are 10 minutes or 15 minutes, right? Ashok, many of the things that you showed, take one minute, half a minute, right? Half a, one phenomenon that you show, right? You say, ha, it blows. Ah, of course, it, it's beautiful, but it takes one minute, no? So, one hour is very rare. <laughs> How long does it take to solve a mathematics problem? I love that. <laughs> so many children are very suspicious. So they are very clear that if it is not solvable in half an hour, it is not solvable, <laughs> right? So, so then we realize that you need projects where experiment takes time, right? Something the children, so I, I feel it's very important to learn to do things with different durations. You need problems that, you know, problems that can be solved in 10 minutes, problems that take like half an hour, one afternoon, two days, three days, and remain open after years of work, right? I mean, to get to that, right? So that, I'm really not talking about mathematics and problem solving and all this, but, you know, there is an undercurrent of that in my head. So children rarely talk science, and talking is something that I want to, you know, give pride of place to. And it's also important that they talk science in the classroom. It's not only about talking science outside, right? There is a qualitative difference between the two. Children should talk science and they should talk science in the classroom. And uh, they don't have, this is what I meant by the title doing science, right? See, whatever we have been talking about is doing science. Not, you know, of course, I don't have to, you know, uh, preach to the converted here, but, uh, and of course, rural children, especially girls, do not see themselves as scientists. And uh, now, the scientific temper is something that is, made such a fuss about. I mean, NEP says, it doesn't use the word scientific temper, of course, how can it? But critical thinking is something that uh, they do mention, right? And uh, so, 
you know, NCF 2005 says that science education should enable the learner to acquire the skills and understand the methods and processes that lead to generation and validation of scientific knowledge. This is the, these are the terms that Nagarjuna uses, right? So this is supposed to be the way that uh, we, you know, talk about validation of scientific knowledge, right? And there is an emphasis on processes. It's always on experimentation, making observation, collection of data, all this sort of business, right? Now, there is, what is very clear is that there is a huge gap. And, you know, with, if you look at what is happening in the classroom and this. So, if you look at 1986 policy, it talks about, sign, you know, in fact, the goals of science education is articulated in terms of economic growth and an SNT based society, right? It talks about manpower. That is the major focus in the 1986. 2005 is talking about creating the scientific temper in children. Now, does Kuruma have any hope of joining the experts, middle order workers and scientifically literate citizens? This is what the policy document says that this vision calls necessary. Can she expect to understand the processes of science and internalize them, right? The, now, of course, the other thing is that the advent of mass education in this country, if you look at the documents from the 1930s and 1940s, right? Uh, Zakir Ruzain writing on education, or, uh, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru talking about things, Gandhi Kumarappa on education. There is also this, you know, expectation, uh, kind of a mood of enlightenment, right? That science education, for Jawaharlal Nehru's writings, we see, Zakir Hussain talks about it, is seen as advent of modernity, right? Something that breaks the shackles of superstition and all the backward, social backwardness in the country. Right? So, it's a means of liberation from casteist and religious domination of social practices. This is actually a quote from Jawaharlal Nehru. Right? So, science is seen as an important weapon against the forces of obscurantism and superstition. Right? And science education is supposed to be a critical component of modernization and social transformation. But on the other hand, science education largely reflects social inequity. Right? And in terms of academic performance, which is the passport, to becoming a scientist for whatever kind of upliftment, Kuruvama has no hope at all, right? And in terms of processes that encourage critical thought and that lead her towards freedom from, see, as a villager, she's subject to all this fear, all this prejudice, right? What is science education offering for her to overcome that fear? Again, very little. And her own understanding of nature, relationship with nature, it's very clear that whatever that is, that is not science. That is not what happens in the classroom. <coughs> now, let me not romanticize Kuruvamma here, right? Kuruvamma needs the language of modern science. She needs that knowledge. She needs what the secrets that book hold. I mean, she needs to go beyond experiential learning. She knows how, you know, she knows how to get things to grow, right? Plant seeds, get things to grow. But she doesn't know nitrogen fixation, no. She doesn't know many of the things that are happening. So. I think modern science is very much necessary. I'm just saying that some, the disconnect between her understanding of nature and what, you know, the book offers is um, alienating entirely, right? And of course, she needs the language of science, which insists on quantification. I don't see the culture of quantification, measurement, you know, understanding error and bounding error comes from, coming from this kind of experiential learning. No, she needs that. She needs that very badly, right? And uh, when she cannot speak this language, you know, the entry into the world of science is denied her. As always, language operates in a, is a powerful means of social exclusion, perpetuating inequity. So I am saying the language of science and the language of mathematics, that is why we talk about children talking science, talking mathematics, right? If somehow we can get that happening and the language of science is something that becomes part of your way of talking and thinking, Forget about writing, that's another thing. In mathematics, writing is also important. But I would say that, you know, that, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, is one of the central area, you know, areas of concern in school education, I would say, school science, right? So what are the areas of central concern in school science that I'm talking about? One is little experimentation, right? No experimentation and critical thinking which comes from there. As I said, repeating experiments is an important skill to learn, but that's not what we are talking about in experimentation. And uh, another thing that I have not even mentioned, little relation to technology, 
right? You learn Pascal's law, you learn Bernoulli's principle, so on. You learn all these things, ask what it is, and children can write equations, say this. But if you ask, how is the truck, you know, huge truck is going on the thing, how is it being held up? I mean, air, huh? It's, you know, you put, it, put a hole and the whole thing, you know, comes down. So how is it that air is managing to hold up? As I said, you learn Pascal's law. But that opportunity to relate what you have seen as a principle to a product, right, of use to human beings in ways, right, which is what technology is about, you know, by work done, right. This kind of things, you know, we don't make at all, right. And of course, let me skip out these things, right. And very importantly in this inadequate teacher preparation, and I think that is very central to this whole business, right. So if we are talking about steps for action, I would say shifting the focus, of the science classroom from content knowledge towards critical scientific inquiry and uh, active engagement of all children in experimentation and working with wood, metal and soil. I mean, you can be, a, I, I was, a, I got a, you know, straight rank in SSLC. It's only after I went to undergraduate studies that I realized that whatever I had learned was not science at all, right? It was only completely memory, right? I mean, handling, if you don't touch wood and metal and soil, what science have you learned, right? That the fact that somehow that physical feel of material, right, and using material to build things is very important in science, science learning. Making connections between areas of science and especially with society. And uh, of course, very critical to all this is changing assessment models. Because when it comes to process assessment, project assessment, we are already, we find it very difficult. Process assessment, you know, the dawn is very far away. I would say it's the dark night. I mean, whether it's undergraduate education or school education, it's the same thing, right? And of course, I would say the priority then is enriching teachers with a variety of resources, right? I mean, so for all these, right? Mathematics, doing, I was saying doing science, right? Doing mathematics means what? It's not about algebra, it's not about geometry, it's not about trigonometry, right? Doing mathematics means working with representations, Looking at multiple representations and deciding which to choose when, right? This is one of the very important mathematical, you know, process of mathematical thinking, right? That, uh, you know, um, a rational, you can, you can represent it as P by Q with no common devices, you know, integers, right? Or you can say it's a number on the real line, right? Both are important. Knowing which representation to choose when is one of the important mathematical abilities that you want all through, right? I mean, somebody was saying, you know, what is a matrix? It's a, you know, what's a linear transformation? It's a matrix. No, what's a matrix? It's a linear transformation, right? So, you have to know what you are talking about when. That's extremely important. And somehow mathematical ability is the comfort between these, right? Which we don't really show that that's what doing mathematics is about. Looking for invariances, right? Whenever something changes, how do you study something that changes? Look for what doesn't change. I mean, it's a great mathematical secret, right? But finding out what is invariant, you get a much better understanding of what changes. I'm saying it abstractly, but you can see it all through mathematics. Observing, you know, this is another very important mathematical ability, right? Observing extreme cases and typical ones to come up with conjectures because there's always this question, how do you come up with conjectures, right? So many of the things that I was saying about boiling points and so on, you can translate to mathematics classrooms and examples. I just wanted to choose some side of it. I mean, how do you get children to make conjectures? How do we get our students to talk, you know, mathematics and make conjectures, right? So if you start thinking like these things, one of the important, powerful devices that mathematicians use is look at, you know, look at the empty set, look at the empty space, look at zero, look at extreme cases, right? That's usually a very, very good hint, right? How do I understand the pathological cases? How do I take, what is a typical case? It's very difficult to define for many problems. And when you ask that question and answer it, very often you can come up with conjectures, right? So these are all things that, uh, you know, well-kept secrets, looking actively for counterexamples. And this, I think, is, oh, yeah. This is a secret. This is a, you know, well-kept secret. Mathematicians don't look for proofs. You look for counterexamples. And that ability to, you develop a certain ability to, you know, look for examples, look for non-examples, look for counterexamples, which helps you to do proofs, right? But 
these are all processes, right? And another one which is unique to mathematics, the particular is very difficult, so you generalize, right? N equal to 2 I can handle, N equal to 3 is looking difficult, N equal to 4, 5 I certainly cannot do. Think of the infinite, understand it well and come back, you will get a much better idea. This is really unique to mathematics and that makes mathematics very powerful. They can give 100 examples of that kind, right? So this is what doing mathematics is about. And of course, you know, something central to mathematics is the idea that you build on answers to generate new questions, right? Any theorem that doesn't lead to a new open question is not interesting. I'm, I'm of course, exaggerating. But the point is that you, it's supposed to end that way. I mean, right, math culture, if you cannot end with a proof, you have to end with some open problem, something that is not, right? I mean, this is part of the thing. So, and these are really mostly missing in school. And I would say undergraduate mathematics classroom as well, right? So the practice of, that's what I meant by doing science, doing mathematics. It is not about learning given mathematics, right? This is very important, therefore we must learn, right? But actually what does it mean to do mathematics, to produce some mathematics? And uh, typical classrooms tend to be, you know, that uh, physical exercises that you see, you know, one whistle and ah, hands up, hands down. And that's basically what everyone going through the motions, right? And interactions between students as well as between students and teachers, something that uh, you don't have. And this kind of processes cannot happen without that. And uh, so then we need to look at curriculum in a different way, right? Curriculum has to be shaped so that processes such as all this long, you know, estimation, approximation, visualization, all this kind of business. So in some sense, what are you teaching? Not algebra or geometry, right? But oh, today I taught this particular kind of visualization, right? Today I was trying to work with this kind of representations. That's really what should be happening in the math classroom, right? It's not trigonometry that I'm teaching, but I'm using trigonometry as an opportunity to show certain kinds of le mathematical learning, right? So, which is important for mathematical thinking, right? So that shift in focus is what we want to, that's what I said. It's a shift from content to process. In all the things that I'm saying, there's only one song, right? It is the shift, shift of focus from content to process, right? And this is certainly, I feel it is within the realm of feasibility, but requires <coughs> great reorientation of classrooms, textbooks, and systemic expectations, right? I'm not talking about individual teachers' expectations. The system already expects you to be bad, <laughs> to be only doing certain things. That's how our assessment models are all, you know, in some sense, there is not, the, I mean, the shadow of the board exam is really long, right? There is not that much difference between plus two board exam and mathematics and, you know, term, September term exam for class seven. There's not that much difference in style, right? Content may be different, but the kind of questions you ask is exactly as alienating as this thing. Even though, it's a, you know, September exam in class seven. So you know the children. So you can ask very different kind of questions, but of course you don't. Because the model of exam was created f in the colonial era for the colonial master to know how the natives are doing from a distance, right? And that is the model that for what you might want for a mass examination. For a mass examination, it's very difficult to come up with, you know, whatever NEP may say, it's not easy for a, you know, an examination that is taken by lakhs and lakhs of students to come up with conceptual, deep conceptual understanding, right? You have to finally translate into some multiple choice thing and, uh, you know, OCR and this is probably or whatever AI program will come to do that job for you, right? But our tragedy is not that. Our tragedy is classroom assessment, right? Classroom assessment follows exactly the same model, right? And that's mainly because our systemic expectations have, you know, got us into a way of thinking. So, okay, now I'm not going to go into these two. This is two I wanted to mention is some things that we had been working on, which is at least, um, maybe I'll give one example and stop with that. Huh? So this was a project with uh, class 11 children. In December 2015, we had this major floods in Chennai, right? So, you know, one of the schools was actually working with people there, something like one and a half million people were evacuated. So it was a huge exercise at the time, right? So tents were being distinct. So they were actually getting tents, stitching them and actually distributing. 
So we got a whole bunch of children involved as some class. So basically design a tent for emergency shelter, typically used by one family. Now, how do you design a tent? How much height is needed for sleeping, for lying flat or on your side? Because you're not going to use, spend much of your time, waking time on that. So can you make use of the whole floor space? If you're going to have so many tents, how do you make sure that you do? And what's a reasonable height at the center? How do you de determine these things? What should be the angle of the walls, the tent walls, to achieve the height needed over much of the tent, right? So, and this was a very, very interesting project. And we said, do you want a tent to fit the average person? Who's the average person? How do you determine, you know, in Chennai, what is the height of an average person, right? Average family, what does that mean? Right? So for children, it was a great project to do. And very important, huh? what scale will you use for diagrams and plans? This is not obvious at all for children, right? So, and this is a wonderful project. And a range of curricular areas uh, intersected. There was data handling involved because they had to find and analyze body measurement data and uh, for purposes of sleeping, sitting. Because the body measurement is different for <laughs> sleeping and sitting and working, right? So you have to take that into account. And uh, geometry and measures, 3D shapes, 2D representations, nets and construction, angles, scale drawing and measurement, finding lengths and areas, right? A lot of trigonometry was involved, some amount of economics and optimization because you had to, you know, the thing was to actually minimize cost, right? And they were actually getting donations and so on and doing this. So, so uh, dynamic geometry software was extensively used. You know, GeoGebra was what we were using for a, a lot of the work. And for children, learning GeoGebra and using it in this particular context was a, you know, great learning experience. And the internet was used for, uh, a lot of information that was needed, right? So, I, I wanted to give an example, I have several examples, I don't want to go down that, but for mathematics, a kind of a problem-based learning, a project-based learning you might call, where many curricular areas intersect. The kind of integration that it brings in and also where you use tools, where you work, where you actually, you know, work with numbers and get results and without this pressure of a unique right answer, right? For mathematics, the greatest domination is the single right answer obtained by the one algorithm that has been taught in class or in the book, right? So that's gone. The fact that you have multiplicity of approaches, multiplicity of possible solutions here, I mean, coming up with exercises in mathematics that have multiplicity of solutions is difficult, but multiplicity of approaches is certainly possible, right? So several such uh, things are there and we found that you know, this is something that you keep hearing world over, right? The move towards problem-based learning, project-based learning, integrated learning modules. I mentioned that term. Now, we were doing a whole lot of things with science in the kitchen and uh, light was one very nice thing where that was a fascinating project when we were doing with students because there's a lot of, you can do bring in physics, there is art, poetry, you know, light is something that, uh, you know, means many, and the even the notion of light and shadow, the play of light and shadow. So it's a very nice uh, project bringing in art and science together. So we can think of many such. Now I'm going to skip all this. But the main idea is, as a paradigm, there is something that seems to be very important in all this, is that there should be some looseness to the problem, right? Uh, and it can be a very abstract problem. One of my favorite problems is, um, okay, I should maybe write it. Okay, let me write it on the board. Is uh, lovely problem. Think about it. So I am saying, so the pro choice of problems doesn't mean that it has to be in this thing. Huh? It can be abstract problems. I mean, so, you know, there are, you take, there are six towns in flat land, right? The shortest distance between them is little m, between any pair of, the longest distance between any pair is big M. Show that big M by small m is greater than or equal to root 3. 
beautiful problem so i am saying problem solving when they get to it doesn't mean that it has to be i am saying problem centered learning because to even think about such problems right what kind of mathematics needed so students ask what do we know this is the important thing right students have to ask what do we know what do we need to know I mean any one who is very clear will know that you don't expect to compute this number no? obviously you are not and you also know that 2 and 5 are a distraction right <laughs> that you put 2 and 5 simply because that you give get 7 there right but and of course children know that it is children it's not that they don't know right but important questions that they actually learn to ask right it is not like you are not asking which formula should i be applying right that's the important progress that i am talking about and they can talk you know you can try many different things and this one is very nice because if you go to google the day will come when google will answer this very soon i'm sure <laughs> but anyway i don't think you can you know go to google and ask hey is this divisible by 7 or something like that but yeah okay so i think i should shut up on now on all this there are lots of examples oh i also want to mention we don't have enough museums and exhibitions and i think this is another thing that really bothers me you know all over the world in many societies we see this excellent uh, this thing this is one thing that we were part of you see a small math science logo somewhere down there with the uh, mathematicum and geesen and the geta institute in uh, chennai and where we had this uh, lovely exhibition which we called mathematics you can touch right so things that children, and you see the soap film here right and uh, you know very very nice projects where they could actually measure do things predict you know prove things quite a exciting thing that we did but there are also very famous uh, math museums that i would you know recommend mathematicum i consider one of the really excellent math museums in the world in geesen in germany but new york has this beautiful collaboration with schools right so there are possibilities that we are not even considering that's all i'm trying to say right because high class science can actually come from high class science institutions but it can have good network with schools right and museums and exhibitions are very very good forms that you see in okay so let me skip on all this stuff uh, tulir already was mentioned by thing science festivals we have found as a very good means you know something that celebrates science something you know joyous where children come together bal melas basically and uh, yeah integrated modules that i was mentioning children science congress is another one that we have been participating in a, in a very long time so where children do projects again something that takes time right 2 to 3 months right typically environment related ecology based projects and where they study something typically in rural areas you go around looking at uh, your local resources mapping them plotting them this is basically the kind of thing that they do and uh, there is a teachers network that we have built up over this over it's quite a long time we have actually a magazine for teachers also and that is a way by which we actually organize the teachers network and uh, we also have some non routine problem solving sessions like this kind of problems that i was mentioning there is also science for new literate women let me see so lastly so does any of this better kuruvamma's prospect of becoming a scientist i mean the structural barriers systemic barriers that exist in society are very strong right and that is the deep problem but somehow changing our classrooms to exploratory spaces offers much better options for children like kuruvamma when you start talking when you start talking science when you start doing science when you start working with material right hands on work there is a lot that can actually bring it i mean this is one of the main things that i wanted to mention and our math education today has almost you know no organic connection at all with science and nature and technology right and science has very little organic connection with technology right and children get you know think of technology as received not as constructed right and this is very important and suddenly how will innovation come right if you know suddenly you know where will uh, uh, technological innovation come if children do not see technology as something that you can construct right and that requires going back to wood and metal and soil right you can't keep you know uh, anyway yeah so new models in schools that emphasize processes group learning and open ended exploration have much better success have you know much greater hope of success with children in the century whatever socio economic background they come from and uh, so let me end with a quote from william thurston 
which I like very much, you know. So he says, as mathematics teachers, we need to pay much more attention to communicating not just our definitions, theorems and proofs, but also our ways of thinking. We need to appreciate the value of different ways of thinking about the same mathematical structure. Now what he says holds for a whole lot of principles of science and math education. Thank you. Sorry, I took much longer. Examples that you talked about, uh, including the ones where like meet the scientists and and those kind of exercises. A lot of uh, those things are done in informal spaces within schools right now. So I just wanted to understand uh, what what are the challenges, if one were to enumerate, <laughs> that exist between taking these from the informal spaces into formal spaces. Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, not really an important question, it's a fair question because when Supriya introduced me, she said that I was part of the NCRT committees and so on, right? So, I've been on syllabus committees and textbook committees, not that, you know, any of this, you know, making an impact is possible there. But there is, see, I mean, I see a certain slope, you know, positive slope. The question was that, okay, you are saying all these things, you are working in the informal space, you know, Science Forum is a, you know, voluntary group going to schools teachers network, you can do all this. What about the formal system, right? What are the challenges in, right? I think I've got it, right? I mean, you're talking about what are the formal, what about the challenges in bringing it to the formal system? After all, that's what we want to change. Of course, our thing is working with government school teachers doing this and also there is a major difference between the formal system. Formal system is committee led, right? I have been part of committees, right? So, Systemic changes, process changes are very hard to bring by a committee, you know, doing a report or producing that thing. But textbooks can make a huge difference, right? So, I think if you look at the NCRT Mathematic series as it's called for elementary schools, primary schools in particular classes 1 to 5, as opposed to the previous ones, I think you will see a huge difference, you know. So, I do see in the last 25 years a significant change in the primary school in the attitudes and the classrooms. Middle school, there has been some effort. As I said, slope is not that high, but slope is positive. There is tremendous rigidity when it comes to secondary, higher secondary, because of the, as I said, the board exam is, con in fact, one uh, planning commission member told me, you know, Raman Jum, you people, all this, kuch bhi karna hai to, class 8 tak karo. Don't you dare touch anything in, higher secondary, right? You can say anti je you can say all sorts of remarks and so on. This is brand value, this is international brand value, don't you dare come near. So, you know, in some sense, it's a kind of social decision that what is it that you're going to get importance, give importance to, right? And there are certain, uh, I mean, see, in India, I see this as more a political implicit decision making process. Hong Kong, um, somewhere in the 2000, late 2000s, actually articulated a decision on mathematics education. And they said, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in the international thing. We don't care for this. We want to, you know, ensure that our children are good at calculation, good at computation, good at this thing. It's okay. You articulate your aim and say that you build your curriculum towards that. Our problem is that we do not have an aims-based curriculum, right? Our, it is not that we say these are the aims, and this is what is the curriculum to meet these aims. So I would say this is one of the, I'm, I would start there, right? The biggest challenge for me is articulating what is the, you know, uh, what I would say are the central failures of the system, which is why I was listing some things, right? Which I, I would say this is the central failure, right? And if you acknowledge that and we say this is the aim of the curriculum, right? Then there is some hope of, and there, we have a very serious problem. Like I said, there is willingness to change um, at, 
at the level of elementary education. I would say there is willingness to change on the part of the government, on the part of the teachers, the teaching community also, there is willingness to change. By the time you get to secondary, higher secondary, there is that kind of rigidity in the system. I would say that the greatest challenge is, uh, you know, perception of undergraduate education, upwardly mobile, what it means, competitiveness, etc., dominates school education so much that, you know, any change becomes almost impossible to, to. So this is where I would put it. Yeah, this is, so, as follow-up to this, like, it, it looks clear that science, learning science is a means to this end of economic where, uh, mobility and so on. Now, what I want to ask you is that, so that is the case even in, say, in, in the US for sure, right, where again they are depending more and more on standardized exams and so on, so on, and therefore making this whole process of learning science as a means to then doing well economically. Now, is there any hope or do you see any countries where they are doing it differently and, you know, in the long term there is a prospect of this becoming, you know, people choosing it like they choose literature or something like that as a, you know, as a cultural thing, not necessarily a means to um, do well. Well, uh, that's more difficult. I mean, I think that's more difficult to envisage an answer because, see, the high stakes exam, yeah, okay. high stakes exams are the problem that we are talking about, right? And that is because of the perception of what guarantees a dignified life. Right? You want a guarantee of a dignified livelihood. If the mo when you get to a society where you feel that, you know, whatever be the degree, whatever be the thing, you are going to, you know, earn a good living and live a life of dignity. If that guarantee is there, probably the pressure on all this becomes much less, right? So, we, we are very far from that. All Asian societies, this is perhaps the central issue, right? Right. But I so, guess even the U.S., which is leading culture in all countries, no, no, is doing... The dynamic how, how, is slightly is that, different is, in how, my how, opinion. How is it in, say, some of the European countries maybe? Is oh, that yeah, better I mean, there? See, in fact, many of these things, uh, I think you see big changes in European countries. Israel is one country where I see, you know, there's a lot of change in the processes and what they are working towards. So many societies, Hungary that I see, Hungary is not one of the, you know, great economic performing thing, but there is a conscious deliberate change in math education that uh, they are introducing and working. Poland is one. There are many societies. Finland, of course, everybody makes a fuss about because of PISA and so on. One of the things that, I mean, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? The PISA exams, Finland has been top performing and they keep referring to that. Singapore, Finland and so on. But nobody mentions the fact that Finland is the only country in the world where a primary school teacher gets exactly the same salary as a university professor. So, so, there, so I'm saying all kinds of systemic changes contribute to it. So, it's not about curriculum and this, right? So, Sweden, for instance, has one thing which to me is very interesting because, of course, it's all public schools, right? They're private schools, you know, three and a half probably. All children go to the work in the public, you know, learn in the public school system. And every school by structure, I don't know whether it's by law, but certainly by structure, every science lab has a workshop associated with it. There is a foundry, there is a, you know, carpentry, all this. So, they do not distinguish between, you know, science lab and a workshop. So, you learn, so it's part of the thing. So, in all their secondary, higher secondary education, children, when they learn science, they're actually doing things in the workshop and making things. A late is part of their learning. So, so there are a lot of systemic changes that are possible. So, and different experiences exist in the world. US, I don't understand, and the US is not one. Again, New Jersey curriculum is very different from, uh, you know, the math wars of California people talk about, right? I mean, so California has something, Ohio has something else. So there is no singular thing in the US that you can point to anyway. Australia, Queensland and New South Wales have very different uh, these things. So it's like our boards. So there is no one particular thing to talk about. So you'll find many different uh, uh, waves. Sir, the structures that you have uh, suggested in this talk, do they trade off with the quantity of the knowledge that is, like the material that is taught in the classroom? Absolutely. I think, uh, I know, I, I personally feel, and as I said, you know, whatever reports you write on committees, I think this is very hard. I mean, I think for sure, in my opinion, if you take the higher secondary mathematics and physics curricula, the only things that I have looked at, 
it should be slashed by half at least. It doesn't make any sense to put in all this. I don't think you need so much. You need much less, but better is this thing. This is going to be very hard. See, remember that it's not just the shadow of the board exam, right? If you want to make your plus two competitive in a certain sense, right? If you're going to do calculus in class 11 and 12, you have to do trigonometric functions in class 9 and 10. And if you're going to do trigonometric functions in class 9 and 10, certain kind of algebra you must teach in class 8, right? Which means you must have integers and uh, rationals and how uh, rational arithmetic all this. So that is how the curriculum is shaped, right? So it is because that curricular acceleration process, right? I mean, when I learned, uh, when I was studying, calculus didn't exist until we came to undergraduate class. Didn't exist. There is no such thing, right? Only in my undergraduate world, I learned calculus, right? Now it's taught in class 11 and 12, right? We had projective geometry. I, had, I learned a lot of projective geometry. It has completely gone from the system. So, so curricula, there is an inclusion-exclusion principle, right? The problem is that the rationale is almost never shared with teachers or with bodies. So, I mean, I can tell more tales of this. But the main point I'm making is that there is a social choice being exercised here. It is not some accidental thing. So to slash it is not something that a committee comes and says, you know, you change it for this. And it's also true that just because you slash the thing by half, it doesn't mean that all these processes will come into being, right? So with the kind of teacher preparation that we have got, I do not see that slashing it is necessarily going to mean great error. People will say, that, oh, we don't have time, but that is an alibi, right? The point is that we do not emphasize processes at all, right? So for instance, one thing that I, in discussion with teachers that I always say is that when I say, you know, experimentation, I do not mean that all the time you are doing experimentation in the classroom. What I want is that in every batch, right, every year, every student has done some experiment. One, can we try that? No. You think we are, we are very far from that, right? So, I mean, I want one child to do genuine problem solving in every batch. In a mathematics class, I am not saying everybody should do all this thing. You can't, you don't have time for that. I mean, in life, you can't do deep things, right? You must do routine things. There is comfort in symbol pushing, right? You must learn symbol pushing because it gives you comfort. If nothing else, you just manipulate symbols and get an answer reliably, right? Good. Learn that also. But you can't be doing that all the time. That's all I'm saying. Once a year is good enough. If every, if we have that as a criteria, right? In every batch, every class, every student has done one genuine problem solving thing, right? To which he or she did not know the answer, to which I didn't know the answer. We worked on it and we got an answer, that experience. Because you learn so much mathematics from that. So I would start very modestly. My point is that our emphasis is very different, right? And we can't blame the board exam for everything. So, so that way priority for me is resources, resources, resources. We need to have hundreds of resources, right? I mean, what I saw in SAC, they should be there everywhere, no? Every district must have all these things. We must have lots of, you know, scientific resources available to teachers. Our teachers, the only resource they have got is the textbook. They don't have, have you seen teacher guidebooks? Teacher guidebooks exist. Teacher guidebooks, if you can go and find copies in diets, you are happy. That's all. It's not in the hands of teachers. You think all of them have smartphones. So does it mean that they have access to educational resources? No. So this is the problem. So making, if we provide a multiplicity of resources, lots of kinds of educational resources, because we all have different tastes. I like certain ways of doing things. I don't, there are some things that I'm good at, some things that I'm bad at, right? So if we provide multiplicity of resources, then we can hope that. And that's really where I would say the Western countries, you know, the amount of the investment in providing educational resources to teachers, various kinds of, you know, UK, if you see the quality of teacher guides, right? Teacher guides, one shot books printed and as well as continuous support that is available is enormous. So probably that's where the answer is. Sorry, long answer. Somebody. Yeah, hey, I can hear. Um, uh, this is a follow-up to Dhruv's question in the sense. Um, what 
a lot of that you talked about was about the um, high school level, right? Um, but as I see it, um, say institutes, uh, I mean, I middle just, school, I would yeah, say middle yeah. school. So I want, I just want to translate it to the undergrad because uh, you cross the twelfth barrier. Um, how much uh, potential do you see um, in institutes like ICER, which are fairly autonomous in designing their curriculum? Um, implementing a lot of these. Um, as before that, uh, do you see there are problems that are say within the curriculums of uh, institutes like ICER, which are supposed to um, promote uh, science education, science temper as its yeah. motive? Yeah. So the thing is, I don't have enough experience to talk about undergraduate education in general. So I'm talking largely from experience, right? But from whatever little I know, right? The, the problem of process is as much present in undergraduate math education or undergraduate science education. That emphasis on content to the exclusion of process, right? And the lack of process assessment is something that I see. But as I said, I don't have sufficient experience. But one thing I was telling in the morning was, before NEP starts getting this thing, if I said quickly implements NEP saying, AE, Amara, NEP, others will follow. Right? So, because that is one thing, right? If IITs and ICER start doing something, right? I don't see the government coming after you and saying, right? They will say that to college, you know, Ferguson College, I don't know, is a highly reputed place. I'm not sure it can get away with saying, hamara NEP hai. ICER can. <laughs> so, in that sense, there is a responsibility. In that sense, I think there is a possibility, as I said, I don't know about IISC, Bangalore, right? But certainly IITs, ICERs and so on, if they do an undergraduate education, if there are some changes brought in and, you know, take NEP into one's hands, <laughs> say this is NEP because who knows what NEP is, right? From the document anyway, it's hard to figure out what it is, right? Before somebody quickly articulates some structures and concerns, UGC is already putting out documents, right? Before people wake up quickly, if we, you know, grab that space and say this is what it means and start doing it, I don't think anyone will. Yeah, part of it is a joke, but that's also I'm saying that, we, I mean, in terms of good models rooted in the country's thing, right? I mean, there is a lot that IITs early on contributed to undergraduate curriculum development, right? Especially in the 60s and 70s, I think it was very important, you know, there is a major contribution to curriculum development in India, right? And in many, many areas and, uh, you know, they led the way, right? But in terms of curricular innovation after that, and like I said, in terms of processes, we do not see much that we can actually point to and say, oh, this is how it came, right? We don't even have, uh, you know, documented history. This is another, you know, terrible thing with India that our, you know, historical consciousness is pathetic. I mean, this, after all, we are talking about 60, 70 year old history, right? A good analysis of the processes over 60, 70 years would give you insight into that. We don't have much of that. But I would think that there are still possibilities. That's about all I can say. Okay, so <coughs> thank you, Professor Ramanujan, for yes, uh, last one. one. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, my question was uh, regarding the assessment. Uh, so, uh, from where I, I come from, Kota, and uh, there, I don't know about other places, but there a lot of emphasis is placed on marks. And that starts from a very young age, like elementary school. So uh, I wanted to understand uh, what my experience says is that when emphasis on, is on marks, the risk taking, like the, the urge to try new things is sort of depleted because you focus more on marks and you want to make safe choices that you can gain those marks. How can, what can we introduce in a classroom that can help the students overcome this? Right. Yeah. So <coughs> oh, this is... Uh I would say again, same thing, resources, right? I mean, um, you would think that for the size of this country, there are many, many assessment models that I can point to. Where do you, we don't. So this is also a very serious problem. In terms of even educational research, educational innovations, I mean, coming up with multiple assessment models is not even seen as a priority in our education system. So here I'm not saying this model or that model. I'm only talking about the fact that we don't have many different assessment models studied, articulated and said this kind of model, you know, so that we can discuss it. We don't, 
right? So that is a very, this is, I would say, the fundamental problem. Uh, once, you know, this is something that, uh, again, in Science Forum, we did once. Uh, uh, so we had a kind of competition, okay? In our society, it's very easy to do it this way. So we said, you can take in class 6, class 7, class 8, Tamil Nadu State Board syllabus, you choose one unit and come up with uh, the most, so assume that there is no CEO, there is no DEO, there is no state government. You are given complete freedom, come up with some assessment for any science unit, syllabus unit of class 7 and this thing. And we issued a call to teachers and we got more than 200 entries, right? And I don't remember exact number, but we ran this two years in succession. And this was also because of a challenge. The Madurai chief education officer, he was very friendly with Science Forum. And he said, oh, what you guys are doing is great and so on. Why don't you guys uh, design the assessment for us? <laughs> okay. Then we said, you know, and naively and innocently, we thought first we'll poll teachers, you know. For, because obviously you don't want to sit in CEO's office and do this thing. We should do it teachers. So we issued this call. We said we'll publish this in Tulir. We have this thing. And, and then, you know, it was really tragic because of the 200 plus entries that we got, 90% of them were standard examinations. They had come up with innovative ways, you know, instead of this thing, you do match the following. You Basically, it's a question answer mode than this thing. One or two people suggested here and there some experiment that can be done, something that can be demonstrated. But it was almost in the quiz, like, you know, have, have you seen the science quizzes where they will ask you to demonstrate some things and so on? It's a bit in that game, gaming mode, and to use a modern terminology. That's about all. So that showed us how stark the situation was. That, you know, we're not touching even the problem, right? So in terms of what it means, that's why I said process assessment, we are in dark ages. I, you know, and this I would say globally also, you know, there are many this thing. But slightly, you know, project assessment is taken seriously enough in big part of the world that it's not reduced to only question answering in an exam mode, right? This is an Asian ma malaise. I mean, throughout Asia, you go to Indonesia, you go to this thing, you go to Vietnam, you know, exam means what we are talking about, right? This is a good Asian problem. It's not so in, you know, rest of the world. You know, children do projects, this thing. Again, because of no high stakes uh, thing. Marks are not considered that important in society, right? So you can do a lot. But, and also even this thing about grades and where to use and all. So the thing is, when I say we need to create a lot of resources, this is also part of what I'm saying. We need to create many assessment models, put them out there, right? Articulate, give names to them, discuss them, say this is better than this, this is better. And some people are arguing that my assessment model is better than yours, right? That is the sort of thing that will generate the, so really very far. And as I said, I don't want to hit the board exam. Mass examinations have their own logic. And that's a problem, that's a severe problem, it's a different problem. What about class 7 September exam? If we can change that, if we can make it, you know, where the teacher owns it, right? The children own it. Right? It's not something imposed from some authority from somewhere. Right? We are moving completely in the opposite direction. US also, you know, asking for standardized tests for everything. Right? One guy in uh, Coimbatore makes a very good living supplying question papers for uh, various schools. It's color coded so he knows which school which he has given things to. Which so you know there are you know good private enterprise available for all this in India, like notes and so on, all this. But uh, So as I said, I, you know, as was mentioned, I am in that committee. I mean, Tamil Nadu has formulated a committee to form its own education policy and all. So I'm not sure. So there are certain things they're very clearly against, right? The state government has taken a very clear stand on language issue and on what they see as Hindutva imposition, Hindi imposition, Hindutva imposition and so on. They're very clear that this is something that, on all the rest, there is as much confusion as anywhere else. But at least what is the argument is that it's not that Tamil Nadu should have, so I think one thing that the media misrepresents also, it is not that Tamil Nadu is rejecting NEP and Tamil Nadu should have its own. The argument is that every state should have its own education policy. It is, you know, federal structure. State has, you know, it's, it was originally in the state list. 
emergency time it was moved to concurrent list. Now it has become state versus center. It should be brought back to the state. So that is the argument that is. So it largely comes from federal principles and saying that a state should be allowed to formulate its own policy. Every state should, to be fair. It's not really that TN should have. So similarly, the argument against NEET and so on is not for student of Tamil Nadu. It should not happen is the thing. It is more these things. But so, as I said, there is enough confusion on many things. So, short answer. Right. Um, thank you very much for a uh, talk that spanned a variety of issues related to education, uh, including policy. Uh, it was really a very, very wide exposition, and thanks uh, for that. You all, it also brought out the, you know, the range of experiences that you have had in so many years. Uh, thank you very much for coming to ISA and I, like we discussed in the afternoon, we okay. hope that you will keep yeah. coming in the coming Love years. To come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here. Thank you.